Now I'd like to talk about loving, loving our enemies or when we don't want, when we don't want to love our enemies. And so I want you to um, almost picture in your mind the uh, someone that you that you don't like. I want you to picture someone in your mind that that frustrates you, that angers you, that has hurt you, that that my wife is telling me to turn the camera. I was just getting in a flow, but here we go. I'll start again. I want you to picture someone that you're you're I think she wanted me to hide this right here. See it? But I'm going to pay for that later, baby. I want you to picture someone who angers you, has hurt you, has disappointed you, has uh, someone that when you're alone or when you're with your spouse or a close friend that you find yourself complaining about this particular individual, someone who um, you, you feel like a bitterness or an anger, someone that you have history with. Um, maybe someone that you've been holding on to uh, garbage for a long time with this particular individual. So I want you to picture this person and you can't stand them. I mean, in your mind, they are, this person is evil or um, just really screwed up. Um, you, you don't want any, you don't want anyone to be friends with them. In fact, your friends you would be appalled if your friends would hang out with them. You would almost see it as betrayal if your friends went out to dinner with this person who hurt you, this person who disappointed you, let you down, betrayed you, wronged you. You couldn't even imagine the thought that someone that you love would sit with, love, eat with, and embrace this person who so terribly screwed you over, hurt you, wronged you. So I want you to picture this person that has wronged you. And then, and then I wanna picture you sort of going into a restaurant and you see this individual who's deeply hurt you, wronged you, screwed you over, disappointed you, someone that you feel bitter toward. And I want you to picture Jesus sitting at the table with them just eating with them, laughing with them, telling inside jokes, right? They're sitting over Parmesan encrusted tilapia and red wine. And you're like, what is Jesus doing with that person? They wronged me. How could you be for this person who's wronged me and hurt me? You know what they did to me? How could you possibly be on their side? In fact, to see God for this person, you feel like God is against you if he's for them. How could God be for them? You get that sort of, of image in your mind of God loving and embracing the one that you don't love and embrace. You know, we talk about loving people and in your mind, you think about, I think about, people that I want to love. We talk about mission and reaching out to people. You think about people. I think about people that I would like to hang out with when I think about mission. Or I think about people that have a really sketchy past or background or whatever, but it wasn't personal to me. They didn't hurt me. And so I'm okay with loving this person, embracing this person, bringing them around the table because it doesn't feel personal to me. Now, I'd like to take you to a moment, like they do in movies, where sometimes you start with a scene, and then they take you back in the history of that story. So I'm, I'm going to take you sort of right into uh, three quarters of the way into the story. And I'm going to give you a scene or an image, and then we're going to backtrack. The scene is this. Ready? Jonah was ticked. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. 
That's why I ran off to Spain, to Tarshish, which is modern day Spain. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So we all love forgiveness when God forgives me. But if it's somebody that you don't like, you don't want to see their story ending well. You don't want to see them rise from the ashes. You want to see them in the ashes. There's a part of you with certain people that have wronged you, you sort of delight in their misfortune. If things don't go their way, you're you're almost secretly happy. You'd love to see their sports team lose. You'd love to see them lose their job. You'd love to see them get a flat tire. At best, you want them to move across the country because this person has hurt you. There's a part of you that if, if somehow they changed and transformed and there was a forgiveness and a reuniting with this individual, there's a part of you that would miss complaining about them because you don't really like them. And so here's Jonah. He's got, he's got these people that they're just pure evil. I want you to think about who these people are for you that you just don't like them. You can't stand them. You love talking about how you don't like them. You really think they're under you. You really think they're worse than you. You really think because of the way that they sinned or the way that their sin affected you, that they're beneath you. Whoever they are, think about them. This is Jonah. And he, and he says, God, I knew it. I just, I freaking knew it. Like, I know what you're like. I just knew you were going to forgive these stinking people. And I did not want you to forgive them. I didn't want things to turn out positively for them. I didn't want things to work out in their favor. That's why I never wanted to go there. Dang it. That's, that's the backdrop of the story. I never wanted to go there. And now he finds himself knowing that, that God was loving and forgiving and gracious. I just knew when you told me to go to these bad people, I knew you were going to do this. That's why I didn't want to go why I wanted to go to Spain. So we're going to go back to the very beginning of the story. One day long ago, God's word came to Jonah, Amittai's son, up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. That's like the worst possible thing that you could hear. If you were Jonah, I'd like you to go to Tarshish, or I'd like not Tarshish. He's like, happy to go to Tarshish. I'd like you to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go to Nineveh. Why? What was what was Nineveh like? I'm, I'm going to give you a couple ideas of what Nineveh was like. Now we think about when we think about different places and sin and brokenness and all kinds of evil and whatever, you might have in your mind images of, of places like Sin City. And you know, you, you might even picture I went to Amsterdam and you could see the naked women on in, in the street corners in the red light district who were probably trafficked that are dancing there. You could see when when you went to places like Prague all of the human trafficking and the effects of it and all of these brothels everywhere. Men would go to the city because the beer was cheap and the sex was cheap. And so they go there for bachelor parties. And you think about these types of places when you think about sin and brokenness and people being used and, and, and abused and mistreated. But I want to paint an even worse picture of what Nineveh was like. And it was personal to the Jews because many of them had seen family members or friends mistreated, tortured, and killed. I'm going to paint a picture of Nineveh, which would be modern day Iraq, opposite the modern town of Mosul. They were known for brutality and cruelty. The grandson of Sennacherib was accustomed to tearing off the lips and hands of his victims. He'd tear off their lips and their hands. Tiglath. Pelissar peeled the skin off of his victims like an onion while they were alive and made great piles of their skulls. 
you had people that would stick poles through children while they were alive, children of their enemies. And they would put the poles lining the city streets and light the children on fire as a sign that you don't mess with us. I mean, this is how wicked and cruel and evil. So I, I want you to picture, I don't know, the, the worst of the terrorists today who chop people's heads off and chop off their hands and torture them alive, whatever it is. I want you to picture that your own family, maybe your, your uncle Barry got captured or something. Or maybe for, for those who had lost loved ones in 9-11 or something like that. And now you get the call, hey, I'd like you to go to the, per, the, the group of people that you despise the most. You don't want them to be saved. You want, you believe that they should all go to hell. Every single one of them. They're evil. They're wicked. They're the worst of the worst. These people need to burn for what they've done. And so Jonah's absolutely ticked as a prophet of God when God says, Jonah, I would like for you to go to Nineveh, because there's a part of Jonah that goes, I know, I know how this story is going to end, and I don't like it. This story is going to end with forgiveness, and I don't like forgiveness. I don't like grace for the sinner. Jonah, in many ways, he is the older brother in the prodigal story. He's ticked off that the father would accept and embrace the son who had done such terrible things, dishonoring the father, running off, living wild, and then he's going to be rewarded for it? I've been good. I haven't been evil like those people. I've been good. And he's going to reward them? He's going to eat Parmesan-encrusted tilapia with them? He's going to laugh with them? He's going to watch Netflix with them? What on earth? How could God be for these people? How could God love these rotten, depraved, evil, sick, twisted people? And so Jonah was not happy. He was not happy that God was sending him to a group of people that were so evil and wicked. Jonah is, unfortunately, what many of us can be, a Pharisee, in that he honored God with his lips, but his heart was far from God. Now, remember the Pharisees, because they... They love those that love them. Remember how Jesus would say, if you love those that love you, what good is it? Even the worst of the worst do that. But he says, I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. Here's Jesus hanging from a cross as people are spitting on him, ripping off his clothes, ripping off his beard, humiliating him, making fun of him, and from the cross, he cries out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Which is very similar to the end of the Jonah story, where God says, why wouldn't I have compassion for 120,000 people that don't even know what they're doing? That don't get it. They're lost. That's how God describes sinners, lost, blind. What do you want to do to lost people? You want them to be found. What do you want to do for blind people? You want them to see. What do you want to happen for dead people? You want them to be raised. You want them to live again. And Jesus came to raise the dead. Jesus came to give sight to the blind. Jesus came so that the lost would be found. Now, I want you to imagine if, if, if Jesus, or if, yeah, if Jesus were to say, go to, if God were to say, go to, fill in the blank. What's Nineveh for you? Who are those people for you? Maybe there's a whole people group that you hate. Be lying if I didn't say that part of my motivation for this teaching is looking around at our culture and seeing how divided people are. How much just listening to conversations, I can tell that people hate each other or hate entire groups of people. There's disdain, there's bitterness, there's hate, there's anger. And I'm telling you, whoever they are, they're not as bad as Nineveh. They're not. What I just described with Nineveh, these people who you're so mad at, 
who you hate, who you can't stand, these people that have hurt you, the, the Ninevites, these Assyrians, these people that are what's now modern day Iraq back in those times were the worst of the worst of the worst. And yet you see this grace that God has toward sinners. Are there people that you wouldn't want to be saved, rescued, forgiven? I think it's really important for you and I to understand as, as we hear this story, um, I, I think we have to understand that we are Nineveh. What I mean by that is I've never ripped anyone's lips off, never skinned a person alive, never done anything like that. But I think we have to see ourselves not as the found, but as the lost. We have to see ourselves not as the righteous, but as sinners. Remember the two people in the temple standing next to each other and the one guy goes, God, I thank you that I'm not like this guy. I thank you that I'm not like the Ninevites. I thank you that I'm not like fill in the blank. Whoever you think you're over or better than. God, I thank you that I'm not like so-and-so. This person that's hurt me, that's wronged me. This person in society that I look down on. God, I just thank you I'm not like so-and-so. And so we have this attitude of superiority. We, we don't see ourselves as broken or sinners. The guy next to him says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he went away justified, unlike the first guy. And I think there's this danger in us to not see ourselves as Nineveh, to not see ourselves as Eve, to not see ourselves as the brokenness of humanity, to not see ourselves as lost or dead in our trespasses and sins. And I'll tell you what, you can't be raised from the dead to life if you're not dead. You can't, can't be found if you're not lost. You can't begin to, you can't, you can't be given sight as a blind person unless first you realize that you're blind. And I, I think for many of us, we just don't see ourselves that way. I don't think Jonah did. He saw the, his, his adversary as, as evil, not as someone who was like him, but with different sins, different issues, different areas of brokenness. He didn't identify with them. He thought he was better than, than them. He actually hated them. We have to look at ourselves and say, am, am I lost? Am I dead in my trespasses and sins? I've got to see myself as, as the person who is arrogant self-righteous, broken. You've heard me say, um, I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, if you ever want to know how bad you are, try really hard to be good. Try for one day to be perfect. One day. And see how far you go before you realize, oh, wait, like, I have this attitude toward so-and-so, or I hate this person, or I flip this person off in traffic or, you know, I, whatever it is, I yelled at my kids. Throughout the course of the day, you realize very quickly how messed up, broken, and perfect. And Jesus takes it even further, right? Because we go, well, I've never murdered anyone. Jesus goes, have you ever hated someone that you murdered them in your heart? Have you ever look, looked at a person with lust? Well, then you're an adulterer. That's what Jesus says. So Jesus takes it to this level that, that basically puts it out there that you are Nineveh, you are broken, you are a sinner, you are imperfect. We've got to see ourselves as Nineveh. Then I want to fast forward to back in the book of Jonah, chapter 4. Okay, so here you go. So, God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. 
he put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broadleaf tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. So there Jonah is. He's ticked off. The backstory, and then we'll come back to this. Backstory is he's told to go to Nineveh. Many of you guys know this story. He's told to go to Nineveh. He flees toward Spain, Tarshish. He gets on the boat. The, the storm, there's a storm that arises while he's on the boat. It goes nuts. And everybody's crying out to their own gods, save us, whatever their names are, yelling out to them. And then Jonah confesses that it's, it's my God that's ticked off. I'm the reason why there's this massive storm because I didn't listen to God. And if you throw me into the water, you're all going to be saved. And so they reluctantly ask God to forgive them, Jonah's God, toss Jonah overboard, and he's swallowed alive by a giant fish. From the belly of the fish, he cries out to God, God, forgive me, save me, rescue me from the depths of this fish. And then he's vomited up into dry ground. And he's vomited up outside of Nineveh. And there he goes walking through the streets, all pukey with fish guts and smells from the acid on the inside of the fish's belly. He's walking through the streets, prob <clears throat> probably has his skin stained from being inside of this thing, walking through the streets, yelling, you're all going to die to the Ninevites. Like God's judgment is going to come upon you. You're all going to die. He's He cries out for forgiveness. He cries out for rescue from the fish. But then when he gets on dry ground, he goes through Nineveh, telling them that they're all going to die, smelling awful, looking like an absolute disaster. And the whole city, the most evil of the evil, the worst of the worst, all of them start repenting. God, forgive us. It's the most incredible scene ever. Could you imagine the worst people on the face of the planet, all asking God, for forgiveness. They tore their clothes. They wore sackcloth and ashes. The king declared a decree. Everybody, the entire, the entire nation is like, God, forgive us. It, it was the most amazing thing. But Jonah didn't want that to happen. He climbs up on top of the hill and he sits there hoping that God will destroy these people. And he says, if you're going to forgive them, kill me. I don't even want to live to watch these people restored, sitting up. God allows this tree to spring up and gives them shade. And then we come back to, but God sent a worm. By dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. <laughs> God said, what's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong to say nothing of all the innocent animals. It's fascinating. Oh, the shade tree in Jonah is the equivalent of watching Disney Plus or Amazon Prime or Netflix and sitting in the comfort of your shade tree and you just don't even want to give a damn anymore about anyone, about all the people that have wronged you, that have ticked you off, society, these particular people that you see as evil or messed up or screwed up. All you want to do is sit in the comfort of your shade tree. And when your internet goes off, 
you get all ticked off that your internet's not working and you lose your crap because the system's down, but you don't have the same type of compassion or care or empathy for your neighbors or your society or your nation like God's called us to have. You know, we can in many ways be like Jonah that way. Have you lost your empathy, your care, your concern for those around you that are lost or dead or blind? I know I have many times. It fluctuates week to week. Sometimes I have these incredible moments of compassion that are gifted to me. But other times I care more about whether my prime video is working than I do about these people who might be hurting or lost or blind. And yet you see Jesus who loves his enemy, who prays for those who persecute him, who forgives them from the depths of, of his own suffering, who takes on their pain and their shame and their hurt and their regret because he loves them. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's the parallel. Jonah, Jesus. Jonah was supposed to go to the people so that they would repent and be saved. Jonah didn't want to go. Jesus wanted to go for the joy set before him. He went. He wanted to go. Jonah went off the ship so the other people could live. He went down into the earth, down into the depths to die so that the people in the ship could live. That's Jesus who went down into the earth. Jesus said, I'll give you no sign except for the sign of Jonah. Just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the, of the earth, so will the son of man be three days in the belly of the earth. And so Jesus did what Jonah did. He went down into the depths. And then he resurrected to life. Just as Jonah went down into the fish, and then he came up out of the fish, onto the land, to the people, but not with a message that he was excited to present for their salvation. He was upset about it. He didn't even want them to be saved. And then they all repented and were saved. And this is Jesus who came up out of the grave and he shared good news for all the nations. As the Father sent me, I send you. Jesus is what Jonah failed to be. And somehow God even used Jonah and he'll even use me and you. Even when our motives are oftentimes bad or wrong, even when we don't necessarily love people, God still continues to use us. And so I, I just wanna um, really encourage you that when God gives us this impossible command to love our enemies, and pray for those who persecute us and do good to those who have wronged us. Bless them. I think we have to first identify as also being lost, dead, broken, imperfect. I think we have to go back to the law which damns us and realize that unless we're perfect, we're separated from God. So you have to be perfect. You have to be holy. You have to be sinless. You can never lust. You can never be bitter. You can never covet. And then every one of us goes, I can't meet that standard. I am, say it with me, Nineveh. I am. So are you. And Jesus said, but I came for Nineveh. You know what that means? No matter how bad you've botched it. Jesus came to save sinners. No matter how much you've royally screwed up, Jesus has come to raise the dead. No matter how low you feel, Jesus has come to lift you up and give you life. And there may be some of us who feel a little too religious. We think we're above those other messed up, screwed up, broken people. We, we've, got to, we've got to identify not, not with Jonah's hate and disdain, but with a man beating his chest in the temple, with the prodigal that runs back to his dad, with the Ninevites who tear the sackcloth and ashes and say, God, forgive us for what we've done. We're just lost. We don't even know what left hand from our freaking right hand. We're just a holy mess. And God will then look at us and declare us righteous. And he'll kill the fattened calf and filet mignon for everybody. Tony Kramer, filet mignon, baby. Jenny Summers, filet mignon. We get to party. 
because Jesus has declared those who were dead alive and lost found. And he spreads a big old table. And just like we started with communion, we've got this eternal communion table that we all get to celebrate and enjoy the table together as a big, broken, imperfect family that God declares healed and right and holy and perfect because of his love. He loves the worst of the worst. He's the better Jonah. He saves us and forgives us. It doesn't matter what religion, per, religious person out there thinks that you're not worth it or thinks that you don't deserve it or thinks that you're too messed up or you got too much of a past. Jesus declares you righteous and innocent. And until you see yourself as lost, you'll never be found. But thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your grace and the story of Jonah. I probably said a bunch of dumb stuff. I know there are some people that are probably frustrated that I use the word damn, but the word damn's all over the Bible, and we would be damned if it wasn't for you. And you became broken. You became sin on our behalf. It's crazy. You took, you took all of that for us. And you looked with compassion on broken people. Jonah knew you were going to do it. And we, if we know you well, I think a lot of us don't know you well. So we think that you're ready to crush us when we screw up. We think that you're ready to, to throw us in hell when we screw up. But you didn't come to condemn the world, but to save it. You came to lift us up from the ashes and gift us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and put a royal robe upon us and feast with us forever. God, just redeem these images of, of you as one who didn't come to seek and save, but to squash and crush and fry and help us instead to see you as a loving, gracious, saving God who comes to redeem sinners and help us to celebrate and just enjoy it and be hilarious about it and help our friends to feel freedom and grace and good news when they hang out with us and help us to run off into our neighborhood, not just looking for the super lovable types, but help us to identify with those who feel like failures they're messed up, they're broken. Help us to see that we're not above them, but to sit with them. And help us to see ourselves as the least of these, that we see that you said, whatever we've done to the least of these, we've done to you. That we would understand that we love you as much as we love the person we love the least. God, just redeem our hearts and our minds. Give us fresh eyes for the world. Amen. All right. You can all talk and argue with me and, and uh, tell me about what you're feeling in response to this. Um, and then we're going to say goodbye to each other. <laughs>